Hello everyone and welcome to another Mondays with Michelle video. This week's topic, passenger lists, where to find them and what clues they might provide. Although many of the websites focus on North American passenger lists, some have links to Australian, New Zealand and South African resources. Let's get started. The first website I'd like to show you is the Library and Archives Canada website. So what we're looking at here is the immigration records information page for passenger lists. And what I like about this website is it gives you a really good idea of what passenger lists do exist for different periods of times, different ports, as you can see from these categories. And the other thing that's nice about this website, they actually have created various databases that are searchable either by ship or by person's name to help you access the information that you're looking for. So you'll notice there are some entries before 1865, but not all of these are available online on this website. But if we take a look at the 1865 to 1935 category, and we click on this passenger list database link, we go to this page with details on passenger lists for this period of time. And if we scroll down, they do give you quite a bit of information as to what you might find. They also mention that you can get copies of this information, a lot of it on Ancestry or Family Search. And more importantly, you can search the database. So on the search screen, I can access the passenger lists in a number of ways. I could type in the name of the ship if I knew it. I could put in the year of arrival, the port of arrival, the shipping line, the port of departure, and if I click on this advanced search option, I can also specify the departure date and the arrival date. So there are different ways to narrow the search down. But to start with, I'm just gonna type in the year. I know that my grandparents came to Canada in 1920. So I'm going to search on that year. And you'll notice there are 2,000 entries. It's showing the first 15 entries on the list. There are 134 pages of entries for the year 1920. So I could narrow it down by specifying the port. I could narrow it down by specifying the ship's name. And I could either go back to that first screen or I could type in the information up top here. So I happen to know the name of the ship is the Metagamma. And you'll notice what it's now done is given me just the entries for the Metagamma. There's 11 entries for 1920. And these up down arrows are sort fields. So right now you'll notice this funny symbol next to the down arrow is confirming this column was sorted by ship name. If I click date of arrival, it's saying we've now sorted the information by arrival date. And I happen to know my grandparents 
came to Canada beginning of August. This entry here is their particular manifest. So if I click this entry, March 7138, I'm brought to a screen that shows an image of page one of the passenger's manifest. And there's some basic information telling me the shipping line, the date they departed, the port of arrival, the date of arrival, the year, etc. Now, if I want to see the details of the image, I would just click on this item. We now have page one of the image, but I think you would agree it's a little difficult to read at this size. Now, there are no automatic plus or minus resizing buttons. If you have a touch screen, you can manually enlarge the item the way you would any image. If you are on a Windows PC, clicking on the image, holding your control key down and pressing the plus sign allows you to enlarge it. And you'll notice every time I press the plus sign, there will be a little image that appears in the top of my screen telling me what percentage I've enlarged to. So right now it's at 125. So using the minus key, I can go back down to 100 or I could keep pressing to enlarge it to something that makes the image a bit easier to read. The one other item I find that's a little difficult there are no automatic page forward, page back arrows within this image. So in order to see the next page, if this is not the page I want to be looking at, page up, page down won't do anything. I have to actually go back using the back arrow on my computer screen. I'm going to minimize my image back down to 100%. I have to go back to this window, change the page, and there's 73 pages. So let's say I try page four, and here is page four. So again, I could use the control plus sign to make it a bit bigger so I could more easily read the names. And see if my ancestor was on this page. And then I could shrink it back down to 100% and use the back arrow to return to the previous page. So that's a bit awkward. There are easier ways to actually look at the passenger list. So one of the other options, if we go back to our passenger list information page, we have passenger lists by name of passengers. So if I click on that database and I go into search, it doesn't have surname indexed information for all of the passenger lists covered by the other database. So it is worth looking at both. But if I search on Renton and Arthur, that's my grandfather, and this was in 1920. And I click search. There's the entry. And if I click on this entry, there it is. The Metagamma came to Quebec City August 1920. 
And this page will be showing my grandfather's entries. And here's the enlarged version of the page. And if I now use the control plus, there's the family. So the very first entry on the page is my grandfather, his wife, and some of his children. The other thing that is helpful on this particular page is looking at the lists of ports and the information that is available. So this gives you a list of the ports covered, the date ranges, and if you are visiting one of the Canadian libraries that hold the microfilms for these records, it does give you the microfilm reel reference number. It also gives you, if we were to scroll back up to the top and press the back arrow, if you click the last item in the table of contents on the left, you get a list of ports and dates and it's broken down as you can see. The nice thing is it also lists some information on American ports. So that can be very helpful if you are trying to determine which ports your ancestors might have gone to. And something to keep in mind, at different points in time, it was actually cheaper for our ancestors to come to Canada and then make their way to the U.S. rather than booking passage from England directly to one of the American ports. So even though your ancestor may have ended up in the States, you should still keep in mind, if you can't find them on passenger lists for Ellis Island, Castle Gardens, or any of the other Eastern seaboard ports that were popular, consider the fact that they may have actually landed in Canada. So another option for actually viewing your passenger lists is to go to the Family Search website. And what I did here was I went to the search menu, catalog search, and under the keyword field, I typed emigration to Canada. And I'm going to click search. And as you can see, there are 2,091 results. And if we take a look, there's a real range. We've got letters from emigrants. We have index of passengers who emigrated between 1817 and 1849. We've got Bristol's pauper children. We've got the Petworth Project assisting emigration to Upper Canada. So, there is a wide range of resources available for you to view. And some of these you can view from home. Some of them you would have to go to a family history or affiliate library. And instead of emigration to Canada, I'm now going to type in passenger lists. Canada. And let's update that link. I've got 99 results. And let's take a look at this second item here, Canada Passenger Lists Collection Record. And this is an actual online database. So if I click to view, I have the option of searching by name, but I can also browse the images. And remember that not all of one of these digitized films is necessarily indexed, so it never hurts to browse through the images. 
So if I take a look, it's now showing me the list of ports and I'm going to choose Quebec and we have a range of arrival dates for this particular port. So you notice this whole collection goes from 1881 to 1922, but the data they have for this particular port starts from May 1900. That doesn't mean there aren't more passenger lists out there for this port for earlier dates, but all that Family Search has in this particular collection is what you see here. So let's click the May 1900, and here are the particular ships. So I'm going to select this first ship, and I'm now looking at the first page of the manifest, which I can page through. One, oh, we've got something with passenger list names, and I love the fact that I have a plus sign. This is why I like searching on Family Search or on websites where I can increase the size of the page because I can now increase it to whatever size I want. They do have a transcript down at the bottom, which I can hide by clicking there if I want. I can download this page. I can print it. A lot of times what I will do is print it as a PDF file, so it saves it for me. I also have different tools where I can adjust the contrast. If we go back and we were looking in this collection, what we actually ended up going into though, is this guy here. This was the one that the collection record funneled us to when we chose Quebec. But if you take a look, do you see how many entries there are? Here's passenger and immigration lists, 1538 to 1900, a guide to the published lists of arrivals. We've got 1801 passenger lists. And this one's got a camera. When you open up the film strip, it has multiple items. So you notice I clicked on the first image. This is actually marriage license bonds for Nova Scotia. Interesting, but not what I was looking for. See this little icon here, which has all the little squares on the left. If I click on that, I am now into a view of everything on this film strip. So item one is marriage bond. So what I'm going to do is just scroll through. There's 800 images here. If I don't get to it quickly and I get bored, then I will just type in a page number. See how this image here says end of item one. We're starting a new item. Okay, well, this looks like German and Swiss settlers. So all I'm saying is sometimes you will have to jump around on the film because they could have five or six different things filmed, but they always have that end image and the start image. And if we look at the next few images, and let's get an idea of dates, 1751, 1752. My point is, you've got an awful lot of information in these passenger lists for New Brunswick, 1816 to 1837, and an index. Some of you are probably familiar with this website called The Ships List, and it's just www.theshipslist.com. This is their homepage. What I will say with this website, if you scroll down to the bottom, it says it was last updated January 2019. I found some pages that might say last updated 2012. 
not all the links on these sites will work properly. But if you find a link that doesn't work, search on that topic in Google to get the new link. That's what I had to do for a couple of the links that they referenced. Any of these sites that are basically a collection of links to other places, it's almost impossible to keep all of those links current. If we look down at special projects, this is what I was excited about. St. Lawrence Steamboat Company passenger records. The steamboats are what your ancestors would have taken if they had come to Canada, but really wanted to go to the US. They might very well have taken a steamboat to go to the next port where they could then transit the border to get to the US. So this is something that they have now put online, these steamboat lists. So it can be a way of helping you kind of build that migration path. So if we look at the Chambly from May 2nd, and they tell you the ticket number, the passenger name, the cabin, and the destination. So these were people going probably from Quebec City to Montreal. You don't get a lot of information, but again, it could be the clue that you need to show that your ancestors were heading to the US or that connection to where did they actually land? Did they land in Canada? So it's another resource that is available. And this particular page gives you details about the different immigration records created at different points in time and the types of information that you can get from those records. This website has so many clickable links and some of them you can only access by going into particular pages. So for example, this is the ship's passenger list page and they've got it sorted by date and then broken down by country. And you can see there are many, many different links to some of them particular ships, some of them particular companies. So there's a lot to explore there. And you can see it's broken down in quite a bit of detail. There's a lot of links to explore. If we take a look, you might think this is the same list, but this is their page for ship arrivals. So we've got a few extra entries. We've got the arrivals and news items for Boston in 1721. We've got the Sydney Gazette ship arrivals. If we go down to Canada, we've got first ship arrivals at the Port of Quebec from 1813 to 1833. So the focus here is the listings, whether it's in newspapers or some other government resources, of the ships that were in port. Another page on the website, they also have pictures of the different ships. And that's this link up top here, ship pictures and ship descriptions. So this is two images they have of the Metagama, the ship that my ancestors came to Canada on. One of my favorite pages on this website is this frequently asked questions. And I found this was really handy because there's all kinds of useful information here. We've got, there's a contract number listed on the passenger list, what was the contract? So it gives you some details. It gives you details about date abbreviations, 
tells you what declaration of intent means. There's a lot of useful information, not just tied to what might be on a passenger manifest, but on other immigration or emigration documents. So this is a useful page. This website also has accounts of voyages and diary information. And reading some of those entries can again give you a really good idea of what our immigrant ancestors would have experienced on the journey and when they arrived in Canada. Another useful website is Olive Tree Genealogy. So you basically have links below this green bar. I clicked on the link somewhere along here that said Canada. So if we look at Canadian genealogy, I, I could just click on immigrant ships passenger lists, or I could go into this Canadian genealogy and search Canadian immigration records. Did your ancestors arrive before 1865? Click here. I'm looking 1535. That sounds nice and early, and it's telling me they've got free ship passenger lists. And you get to this page, ships passenger lists before 1865. But notice here, there's all these immigration projects online. They've got things from the early 1800s, 1818 index to miscellaneous immigrants before 1865. So again, I think it's a website that's worth looking at. Once you know the name of the ship that your ancestor came on, what I found interesting was I Googled the ship name and it brought me to the Wikimedia website because I wanted to see what pictures were available. So the nice thing is there are also links to the company that built the ship. There is some basic information and specs about the ship, but what was really interesting to me is at the bottom, there are all these pictures of the cabins and of the common areas on the ship. So when you're trying to get some idea of what the voyage was like for your ancestors, this was something, quite frankly, I wasn't expecting to see. I hadn't stumbled across any of these interior images before for the ship that my grandparents came to Canada on. So I found that was really interesting. And when I clicked on this Clyde Ships link, it took me to a website that had more information on the ship itself. Another website I really like is this G&G &G Archives. And <clears throat> it has a limited number of passenger ship lists. But what I liked was all of the other memorabilia and documents. So I found a Canadian Pacific cabin service to Europe brochure covering all of their steamships. And when you look through, this was the type of steamship that my ancestors came to Canada on. Again, they have these images. I loved this one, the, the children's playroom. But again, to give you some idea of what these ships were like for those who were traveling in cabin class. And what I also found interesting, there's all kinds of links on the right. Another area of the website I went into they talked about the Canadian immigration laws and how things changed over time. And they had an article about 
the free passage to Canada after World War I for servicemen. So depending on what it is you are looking for, websites like this one can provide a lot of background information, a lot of images that you might not find easily in other places. So it's worth having a look at this website to see what you can find. Now another website that has um, some useful links is the Immigrant Ship Transcribers Guild. So this particular page has links to uh, different passenger lists that they've transcribed and it's broken down in all these different categories and it's broken down by volume. So there's a lot of information there. This page is also the Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild and it's showing some of the different lists that they have transcribed or that are available as links through this website. So again, if you take a look, there's a lot of different information. So here are the databases, the transcriptions, some of them that they've done. So we've got some departures listed. We've got the names of the ships. So again, a lot of useful information and some of these may not be on Family Search or Ancestry or the other big name websites. So it's worth exploring what these ships passenger list websites offer. And I wanted to show you this link since many of you do have ancestors who went to the US. This is an article um, from the National Archives about US immigration records and the importance of what are called the St. Albans list, which is the border crossing lists at St. Albans for people who were coming from Canada to the US. St. Albans was one of the popular crossings and it gives you a lot of information on what those lists were all about and what you can expect to find. And the last link I wanted to show you, since many of you will have ancestors who came to New York, whether it was through Castle Garden or Ellis Island, and this website has various lists and finding aids to help you locate passenger lists for your ancestors coming directly there. I hope you enjoyed this week's video. Don't forget to download the handout. You'll find the link in the video description at the bottom of your screen. You may need to click show more to see the handout links. Thanks for watching.